Yes. So this is a very good question that should be addressed now. Irma Pineda, um, who we all know and who I translate into English, um, she, we actually have known since July that she wasn't going to be able to come because she couldn't get um, permission from her employer to let her out of these days working. She teaches um, in Mexico. and. Somehow that information wasn't translated to the right person at Alta to have them taken off. So I'm I do apologize for that, but thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, Irma Pineda is not here, but now I have a really good idea for what I need to do in order for her to be able to attend next year um, in the Bay Area. So hopefully that will be possible. And then did you have your hand up? Awesome. Okay. I think we're going to touch on all those things in different ways. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, so again, thank you so much for being the stalwarts at the end. Um, I'm going to introduce my dear co-panelists and myself, and then I'm going to give a little bit of talk about translating Irma Pineda. Um, and then Claire Sullivan is going to talk about her experience um, translating what became this incredibly beautiful book that I will pass around that was published by David Shook's publisher. Um, and then David is, Shook is going to show us a little bit um, of a documentary that he's working on about one of the many poets that he translates, um, and then maybe talk to us a little bit about the process of creating this anthology. So I'm going to pass these both around while I do the introductions. Are they available for sale? Well, not now that the bookstore is but you know, do you have them in your backpack? Do you have more? Am I? For a certain price. For a certain price. There <laughs> might be one in David's backpack. So, um, <laughs> so Claire Sullivan and I met at Alta in 2009 in LA, which was the last time I was able to attend this lovely gathering. And Claire invited me to be part of a panel that she um, organized at that Alta about translating Mexican women. Oh, and, and Jen Hoffer. And Jen Hoffer, who we hey. also met there, was the third per panelist at that session. Um, and here we are again. And so David Shook's publishing house, as I mentioned, Phony Media, has just published Claire's lovely translation of Natalia Toledo's 2005 collection, which won a major award in Mexico called Olivo Negro. Um, the English title is Black Flower and Other Zapotec Poems. Claire has also translated books of prose by both Argentine and Mexican writers. And she is a professor of Spanish and um, director of a graduate certificate in translation at the University of Louisville in the city where she lives. And she's going to be talking about um, the process of, of translating Natalia's poetry. And David Shook is the author of Our Obsidian Tongues, which was published in 2013. He's also the co-founder and the editorial director um, for both the online journal Molossus and um, Phony Media, which does both book and other media video um, production. And I, you are seeing as it goes around um, one of the results of Phony Media, Like a New Sun, which came out in September. Is that right? No, uh, no. Oh, like in a son, I think is uh, last week of August. Last week of August, um, that has uh, work from six indigenous Mexican poets, including um, at least one who or two that we will talk about today. And David has translated into English from nine languages. That's kind of amazing to me, um, since I only do one, and including several that are are native languages and or indigenous um, or endangered languages. And so he's going to show us a video clip um, and we're going to be talking also about the ethics of, of what we're doing and, and how we feel about that. Um, my name is Wendy Call and I am primarily a nonfiction writer. I moonlight a little bit as a poetry translator and I became really interested in indigenous literature in particular. Um, I had never done any translation when I was working on a book about southern Mexico and I started um, translating some of the literature of that region as a way of, of gaining some level of understanding um, so that I could write in English about these communities. Um, I teach creative writing and environmental studies um, at Pacific Lutheran, which is a university in Tacoma, 
and I am particularly interested in connecting indigenous women writers from Mexico with U.S. audiences um, in, in different ways. And um, as part of that, um, the poet Irma Pineda, who I'm going to talk about today, she and I organized a, a gathering of indigenous women writers, um, both poets and prose writers, in Oaxaca in 2011. Um, Claire attended that gathering, um, and so did, and Liliana actually helped me organize that gathering, Liliana Valenzuela, who's here. And then Claire and Irma Pineda organized a second gathering um, for uh, some of the same writers and poets uh, that was in Chiapas in 2013. And, and Liliana uh, was there. And Liliana was able <laughs> to come to that one, yes. Um, and I am currently working on my second collection of Irma Pineda's poetry in English while I, um, over the long haul, seek a publisher for the first collection of hers that I finished translating last year. So um, I'm going to. It's not moving forward. Oh, can I? I can do that for you. Well, it, it, no, it's moving forward here. It's just not projecting. Oh. So. Oh, wait a minute. Should I go find our the guy? Let me see if I can make this work. So what I have here, just a here we go. Yay. Here's where we are. The little blue star uh, is Huchitan. All three of the writers that we are talking about today are from Huchitan, which is an Isthmus Zapotec community um, in the Mexican Isthmus. Who here has um, heard of Isthmus Zapotec? Yay, most wow. of the people here. Um, so as you um, probably know, if you are familiar with the language, it was probably the first written language in the Americas. So you know, several hundred years before the Maya started um, carving stele onto, um, or carving their glyphs onto stele, I should say, the Zapotecs were also using a glyph-based system um, for recording things um, in Oaxaca. And so this glyph recording system, which some people think of as a language, some people don't, here's an example of it, um, persisted for 1,400 years. Um, it stopped being used probably about 500 years before Europeans showed up in the Americas. Um, and then Zapotec literature kind of went back to being an oral tradition. And then about 120 years ago, um, Zapotec writers began using uh, transliterated Latinate alphabet uh, to write down their literature once again. And, um, and here we are today with lots of published Zapotec writers. So this is um, Irma Pineda, the poet, um, not the only poet, but the primary poet I work with. And Irma was born in 1974. Like most um, Isthmus Zapotecs, she spoke entirely Zapotec at home and entirely um, was educated in Spanish at school. And so she never learned how to write her language. And so she talks about how when she began to um, create poems, to create poetry, she would do them in her head in Zapotec. And then she would go to friends' um, bookshelves and pull out Zapotec books, of which there weren't very many, and then look for the words that were in her memorized poems in the books and then write them down. Um, now, you know, this is even harder than it sounds, and I think it sounds pretty hard, because there are five different orthographic systems used for Zapotec, um, which we could talk about later. It seems like m more than you want to know. But one of the things I think is interesting is that the one that now most writers currently working in Isma Zapotec use, including Natalia Toledo and Victor Teran, was the um, orthographic system that was come up with by uh, missionaries at the Summer Language Institute. There are four other systems that were all um, developed by writers, um, essentially for them to write their own work. Um, so Irma says, I started writing poems in Zapotec without knowing how to write well in Zapotec. I, was taught, I wasn't taught to read Zapotec, so I didn't know how to represent the sounds. I didn't have a dictionary. I didn't even have a grammar book. And so one of the things that Irma talks about a lot, let me see if I skip something there. No, there we are. Uh, is that she really feels pressure to only produce bilingual work. That if she wants a readership outside of really her town, then she needs to translate her work her, into Spanish. Uh, and so she talks about how sometimes when she creates a new poem and writes it down in Zapotec, her first thought is, oh my god, now I have to make another poem in Spanish. Uh, on the flip side of that, she ha she's published six collections of poetry, um, all Zapotec Spanish. She has an entire collection that is written in, in Spanish only that was inspired um, by 
European works of literature that she was reading in Spanish translation. So she says she didn't feel like there was any point to write these poems in Zapotec because she thought them in Spanish because they were part of her kind of formal education. Um, and that remains her only unpublished collection of poetry because she's now sort of boxed as, you're a Zapotec poet, we want you to be bilingual and to publish everything um, bilingually. Uh, so this is the cover of her fifth collection of poetry, um, which I will butcher the translation or the um, the pronunciation of Do You Ne Gabia? I don't know how to pronounce Zapotec. I don't know Zapotec. Um, but the Spanish title is De la Casa del Ombligo, uh, Las Nueve Cuartas. And the Span does who in this room does not speak Spanish? Everybody speaks Spanish. Great. Awesome. awesome. Okay, so I don't have to tell you how badly that title will translate into English if you translate it literally. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I do want to mention one of the things I love about this particular collection is that it is available for free download um, at the website of the institution that published it, which, which is the Comisión Nacional para el Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas. And if you Google the, the Zapotec name, nothing else is called that, so you will go straight to where you can download this book. Um, it is a book of poetry. It has been downloaded 7,000 times since 2008. So um, pretty amazing readership. Natalia um, Toledo, has an, uh, one of her books of poetry is available online, and um, it's been downloaded now over 10,000 times. Um, but getting back to the title, Do You, the first half of the title, would translate literally as Cordon Casa or Mecate Casa, if you, in Mexican Spanish, um, into English as Cord House. Um, Irma says, you know, if I write cordon casa, no one is going to know what I am talking about. But if I say casa del ombligo, everyone in Mexico will know what I am talking about. Um, now, of course, in English, if I say house of the umbilical, umbilical um, mm -hmm. that really doesn't help us at all. So what this refers to is an indigenous custom um, pretty widespread in Mexico and elsewhere you know, maybe falling into disuse, certainly falling into disuse, in which you bury a baby's umbilical cord in the, you know, at the home territory, land, you know, piece of land, um, garden, so that you will always have this literal, you know, connection between the place you were born and wherever your life takes you. And so these, a lot of these poems in this book are about this connection, both on the literal level and also on a metaphorical level. And so when I um, translated this term into English for these poems, I um, used the term lifeline, um, not because that's what it says in Spanish, but because that's one sense of what it says in, in Zapotec. And one of the things that Irma talks about a lot in, um, when she talks about her translation is that she doesn't, and I've been using the language wrong, she does not think of Zapotec poems that she wrote and then Spanish translations of her poems. She talks about mirror poems or parallel poems where essentially every poem has a twin but it's not an identical twin. And so she creates the poem in one language, she, re she recreates a new poem in another language that relates. Um, the two poems relate to each other. So sometimes I work from, you, I mean generally I work from Spanish of course because that's the language I read, but often I will take things from the Zapotec that are not um, in the Spanish um, because I kind of feel like I'm drawing from both of these sort of fraternal twin poems and creating a third poem. So what I have here um, are the Zapotec published version of one of her poems and then what we call the Spanish literal translation and where this comes from is um, I sit down with Irma after I've done a draft translation of a poem using the Spanish and I have her just tell me what each line literally says in Spanish and I write that down um, and sometimes they're really the, the literal Spanish and the published Spanish are very similar sometimes there's only a couple of differences sometimes there are a lot of differences and so then um, Unfortunately, I couldn't get this all on one slide because it would be helpful, but here, I'm, I apologize if this is really tiny, what we have is the English, my English translation, which is very much work in prof process, I haven't published this poem um, since you left, the Spanish public, published version, Cuando te fuiste, the literal version of the Zapotec, um, Cuando te fuiste, but as you can see in this case, her published version in Spanish and her kind of literal translation from Zapotec are quite different. Um, and I sort of merge them together in, in my English, which is still kind of in process. Um, so one, some of the, cha the, the, the 
changes that she makes are really interesting to me. Like in the Zapotec version, the title and the first line are the same. She didn't do that in what she published. I've chosen to do that in English. Um, at the very the very last line um, that double my pain, the the version she published in Spanish just says that measures my pain. Um, and then the Zapotec version, if you were to translate it literally, says um, that, way, you know, that weighs or that doubles my, the pain that I have in my heart. Um, and one of the things that she talks about in Zapotec is that you can have emotional pain in different parts of your body. And the part of your body that is referred to when you talk about emotional pain indicates to another Zapotec speaker a different kind of emotional pain. Um, it, you know, she says that doesn't really happen in Spanish. Emotional pain is emotional pain. And so when it, often in her poems, her, there will be pain that refers to a particular body part. Those are always left out in Spanish. Um, I decided to leave it out in English too, but I did include the double because I thought that specificity was, was interesting. Um, and I'll give a talk about just one more little aspect of, um, or it's not a little, a big aspect of her poetry, and then hand it over to Claire. Um, so there's this really, there was this word that I kept coming up against over and over and over in her poems, um, which it's in this line that I'm not going to try and say, pronounce in Zapotec, but we have, our language molds the gift of our thoughts, which is the English translation um, of this idea. And so she, Irma, talks about how um, this kind of saying in Zapotec has been crucially important to her development as a poet. And so the word that I kept coming across that led her to give me this explanation was that there was this word, um, genta, genta, or Q-X-U-E-N-D-A is how it's used in compounds and when it's often used as a modifier. If it's used as a noun, it's genta. And here you can see just some of the ways that she has translated that word into Spanish and then some of the ways I've translated into English in working with her poems. But the genda is, um, as Irma explains it, it is our parallel being in this life, the being that journeys with us through life. If something bad happens to your genda, which is your totem animal, you will be hurt as well. She also talks about how that um, is works on a metaphorical level as well. You are, you know, described as having like a genda for poetry if you were a poet. Or if you were chosen to do something really important in your community, that is a genda in the sense that it's a gift. It's something that you um, have been given. And so, sorry, did somebody want to say something? No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself. It just sort of reminded me of Blanda in Spanish, you know, when you're... Ah, so which is interesting. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've thought a lot about sort of the duende genda how they overlap and how they don't in terms of how they're described to me. I will say that whenever I, whenever I have somebody describe duende to me, the description I get is completely different depending on what country they're from and what region of Mexico they're from. So it got so complicated, I stopped thinking about it. <laughs> um, and so this is just one way that she uses this term in my English translation um, from one of her poems. And here, when she talks about the gift of the jaguar, the gift of the eagle, she's talking about two different Zapotec legends of the um, ancestors of the Zapotecs, one of which one ancestor is a jaguar and one is an eagle. Um, and then um, the last little thing I wanted to talk about in terms of like specific translations and, and, and doing it, we're using both different languages. This um, Gelapetne is the name of a swimming hole in Huchitan. So as you can see in Zapotec, everybody knows that, right? Everybody that speaks Isthmus Zapotec. So we don't have that little epigraph on the poem explaining where the crocodiles abound. Um, and here, and I think Claire actually might talk more about this because she did a lot of this in translating Natalia's poetry. Um, there are things that get lost when you move to Spanish because you just can't do them from Isthmus Zapotec, but sometimes we can bring them back in um, in the English. And so here, um, in the fourth line of this poem, the word, the, the, the Zapotec word, um, bishuba, B-I-X-U-U-B-A, um, means both to swim and to lay eggs. 
pretty awesome like double meaning for a verb. Of course, that didn't work in Spanish, so she didn't even try to do it in Spanish. Um, and so that line in Spanish would literally read where the crocodiles laid their eggs. Um, and the Zapotec version of this poem, you can't see it here because it's in the second stanza, but it also has an end rhyme. And so when I was talking about this poem with Irma, she said that she really wanted one end rhyme in the English version because it is kind of a whimsical poem or a poem that has a whimsical aspect to it. Uh, and so I reproduced you know, a slant rhyme in the first stanza um, when I was bringing it into English. And then I also um, kind of took liberties or combined the two in that one line where the crocodile's eggs swam. Um, trying to get at that double meaning of laying eggs and then and then something swimming in um, Spanish, and I think I will stop there so that we can move along and then talk later. <laughs> so if you just hit escape, you should get okay. out of there, and then actually you could just close it. Don't save. Translation can be viewed as a cultural and linguistic usurpation. For literature written in indigenous languages, it's a necessity. Indigenous languages in Latin America are disappearing rapidly due to the dominance of Spanish and more recently English in languages of commerce and communication. So many people, even poets and teachers who love their language, don't speak it to their children. And the formal educational system does not lend itself to language preservation. Didactic materials are published almost exclusively in English. Public school teachers are sent to regions where they don't know the native language. So translation is necessary so people will be able to read literature from their own culture and share it with the rest of the country and world. The question becomes then how to do it well. Of course there will be losses. In the case of Isthmus Zapotec, for example, the intricacies of sound that include glottal stops and different tones can't be maintained in Spanish or English. But what can be preserved in translation? For Natalia Toledo, her strong imagery that evokes life ways also in peril can be translated. In particular, she represents regional foods of the isthmus, sacred role of animals in Zapotec culture, customs like weaving, natural medicinal practices, passing on oral wisdom, games that children create. But how can we translate this imagery without infantilizing its subjects or taking out a patronizing attitude toward what could seem a quaint but antiquated way of life? One way to accomplish this is to try to recapture her vivid and sometimes unsettling imagery in full color. For example, Zapotec people see the natural world and even everyday objects as having body parts. And Irma Pineda explained to me, we talk to things as if they had bodies. We personify everything, we humanize everything. These features that she mentions are very present in her poem, The House of My Dreams. Voy a la cocina, las ollas son al vientre, el vientre de mi madre, desciendo de la montaña, enfrente una casa de caliche destentada. Tengo ocho años y mi cuerpo es una casa que recuerda su casa. In her translation into Spanish, Toledo manages to capture two of the three images from the original Zapotec in their subtlety. She has womb-like cauldrons and a toothless house. But the final imagery of the house as a body loses this complexity because in the original she uses two different houses, Ju for the physical structure and Liji for the home or hearth. In English I lost the second metaphor because I translated the verse as a house with missing tiles, but I tried to recapture the complexity of house home. Toledo also presents striking imagery when she writes about food. She begins her section of culinary poems with a Zapotec refrain, and la cocina and El que juega su sexo tiene buen sazón. I tried to replicate the masturbation metaphor with a hand in the bush makes sweet work in the kitchen, but was that, <laughs> over, was that over translation? Michael Cronin in his book Translation and Globalization warns, and I, and I quote, 
Translations in minority languages are thus placed in a classic, classic double bind if they allow the full otherness of the dominant language to emerge in their translation, inviting anglicisms rather than eliminating them, the language into which they translate becomes less and less recognizable as a separate linguistic entity, capable of future development, and becomes instead a pallid imitation of the source language in <coughs> translatorese. On the other hand, if they resist translation and interference and opt for more or resist interference and opt for more target-oriented communicative strategies that domesticate the foreign text, the danger is one of complacent stasis. Translation is no longer no longer functions as an agent of regenerative of regeneration in the target language. So how can we acknowledge the differences among languages and use them to enrich our own language through translation without alienating our reader or exoticizing our subject? Um, food, again, provides a common ground. In a poem dedicated to Jaime Garcia, Toledo describes dishes that don't exist in other regions of Mexico, let alone in the United States. Por la noche de las tlayudas y garnachas. At first, I tried to describe the foods, and so I said, for the frisbee-sized tortillas and small corn <laughs> tortillas filled with meat and cheese. <laughs> but then I realized that the names evoke regional dishes that are unique and that images can be found with simple Google searches. So I settled for for the night spent eating tlayudas and garnachas. Another way to try to preserve the original Zapotec verses is to acknowledge and play with the differences in sound between Zapotec, Spanish, and English. Cronin <laughs> warns again, and I quote, thus the radically dissimilar lexical, syntactic, and ph phonological structures of, I of Irish are ignored as they question, um, as are questions of illusion, resonance, and intertextuality. Though he's talking about the translation of Gaelic or Irish literature, the same features can also be examined in the translation of indigenous languages in other countries. Take sound, for example. Since it's a tonal language that frequently employs glottal stops, Zapotec sounds nothing like Spanish or English. The sound, the sound Zapotec poetry, or the sound of it, is what attracts listeners around the world, even when they don't understand it. As translators, we can't simply settle for relegating that essential element of poetry to the trash heap. But how can we account for differences in sound and still create poetry um, in English? For the most part, Toledo has translated her poetry without considering sound directly. She has recreated images, scenarios, witticisms, conflicts without consciously trying to recreate sound. I've tried to go back to the original Zapotec and listen carefully to the rhythms, rhymes, and near rhymes, but my gains have been very small. For example, in her poem, oh boy, can I say it? Guacalachi Niza Neo Nalagidi. The first line re reads, Guacalachi Niza Neo Naladigie Naladigie. The words Gie and Gie, one of them has a apostrophe at the end, are near homonyms because they sound almost alike, especially for a non native listener, but mean two different things flowers and stones. And the Spanish, desee ca caminaras conmigo en, en las flores, pero también en las piedras, doesn't respect that repetition. So after much deliberation, I settled on, I wish I could walk with you on petals, but also over pebbles. It's imperfect, but, it's, but sometimes we can only be aware of where we're falling short as translators. So as Cronin points out, there are other factors to consider in translation. One that can prove helpful in conveying to Toledo's poetry in English is intertextuality. Since the Isthmus has long been a crossroads of culture, Toledo, like many other fellow writers, most notably Victor Turan, who David translates, are well, well read in world literature. The fi final poem of the collection of the Black Flower is dedicated to T.S. Eliot. It contains a line, thank you, contains a line from The Wasteland among its verses. It is a gift to English language readers to find a verse from one of the language's most esteemed poems in the center of Toledo's poem. But she doesn't borrow this verse simply to impress readers with her erudition or to honor the memory of T.S. Eliot. By borrowing this line and presenting it in Zapotec, she's transforming the context and forcing us to see the words from another point of view. Consider the verse. What are the roots that clutch? What branches may grow out of this stony rubbish? In the context of the poem, Toledo asks what the future of her indigenous language will be. After Eliot's verse, she adds two of her own. Perhaps I am the final branch who will speak Zapotec. My children, homeless birds in the jungle of forgetfulness, will have to whistle their language. Toledo uses our own language to criticize the obliteration of languages through globalization. At the same time, she relies on other languages for the survival of her own. As Cronin says, it is precisely the pressure to translate that is central rather than peripheral 
a peripheral aspect of experience. In this respect, for minority languages themselves, it's crucial to understand the operation of the translation process as itself as the continuous existence of the language. Another factor that enters the translation process from Zapotec to Spanish is the use of Nahuatl. Um, since Nahuatl is a much larger language group than Zapotec, especially in, in the capital, Nahuatl words are well known by non-indigenous speakers. When Toledo translates terminology from Zapotec to Nahuatl, she makes the imagery more accessible to readers in other regions of Mexico. And um, the poem, for example, Childhood Home, that she writes, contains four Nahuatl words to refer to plants, foods, and household items. I kept those words in my English translation, though I put them in italics. Th this choice was made in part to heighten, heighten the difference between our culture and Zapotec, but also with full realization that these words would be readily accessible to, to readers via internet. And in fact, three out of four of them pop up immediately in, on, as Wikipedia entries. Um, <laughs> how can we translate in a responsible way that makes our eventual readers aware of the process itself and the risks it poses to the original language? Take, for example, the poem, um, Zuba. The poem bears the name of a flower from, a, from the white jasmine, uh, the name of the flower of white jasmine at, 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 of the isthmus. The primitive name of the flower, Itza Shoshitlan, which became Shoshitlan, which became Shushitlan, and Hushitan, the name of the town where Natalia and Irma are from, and of the people, the Huchitecos. Um, but there's no name for that in Spanish. So she retitled it as, in Spanish, as flor que se desgrana, or flower that loses its petals. This name describes what a particular flower does in May during the hot season when Tuchitan celebrates its patron festival. But a reader in Spanish or English would not know any of this from the simple descriptive title. Um, so the English title could echo the original title with Isthmus Jasmine. And I'm not sure which would be better. <laughs> um, there, are, there are other references in the same poem that can easily be lost on the trajectory from Spanish Zapotec to Spanish to English. One is the Berelele, a bird that says its name and announces changes in the weather with its song. And if we have time later, I'll show you the bird making that song. The translations to Spanish and English lose the connection to sound and custom. Indeed, the translation reveals a severed connection to the natural world. The poem ends thus. Why did you turn your back upon the star that nodded your navel? The word for navel in Zapotec, zipilu, is charged with connotation because it refers not only to a part of the human body but to first house and represents human origins, which goes back to uh, Wendy. As Toledo's poetry demonstrates, the Zapotec as a people are aware of the body and its functions on many levels. I wanted to take up the theme I mentioned when I was talking about Ismus um, Jasmine that echoes through many of her poems, and that is the role of animals in the lives of humans. In the poem, um, Wenda or Nawal, Toledo explains the birth ritual of divining the animal who will serve as a protector to a child. As I was being born, my father sharpened the tip of a reed and drew the animals that ran through his mind upon the damp earth. The earth told him which would be my devil, the lizard. The lizard has a prominent role in Zapotec cosmology since God created the world from the roots of a seba tree at its center that became a lizard. Another poem that describes the rite of passage that of dressing in traditional clothing to go to the patron festivities also foregrounds a lizard. The poem begins, facing the sky like a lizard, to show that human beings like animals are subject to the elements and vulnerable to the natural world. It ends, I'm going to the fiestas to dance, and if it rains, the heart of day will hurl a rainbow upon my weepil and my eyes. When lightning falls, the sky burns. I open my lizard mouth and drink its fire. Such a metaphor sounds strange in Spanish or English, but this understanding and connection to animals is part of, of Zapotec worldview. And T Toledo's most recent work is a collection of Zapotec onomatopoeia from both ancient and contemporary culture that she translated into Spanish. This presents a considerable challenge since the su success of onomatopoeia resides in its sound. How can we account for the difference of sound across language and culture and still convey meaning? The first onomatopoeia in the book brings together the animal world and the culinary realm. Zigui, zigui en el monte, rau, rau en el árbol, mi buco, mi buco en la olla. It's a riddle made of sounds, and the answer is an iguana, a normal part of the landscape and diet in Huchitan, but who would ever guess the answer to the English riddle? In her translations of onomatopoeias, Toledo has not changed the original sounds. For example, the bell tolls quam, 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 and the horse gallops garapa, garapa, garapa. At first, I was attempt tempted to change the sounds of the bell to gong or dong in English, but the context of the sound is a, is a scene particular to Huchitan in this, in this um, 
anomalía, memoria, sobre el tejado de mi infancia, el grito del cochino, el canto del sanate y la campana de San Vicente, cuam, cuam, cuam. Though the animals mentioned could be found in rural towns and other parts of the world, the bell here is the bell of St. Vincent. In the 16th century, Dominican friars evangelized the isthmus and visited Huchitan and renamed it San Vicente de Huchitan with the patron saint of San, Vin San Vicente Ferrer. The Huchitecos referred to it affectionately as Z Z Zavizende, Za, seat or place of in Vicente Vincent. The biggest challenge comes in the final poem of the book where the verse hinges on wordplay that doesn't exist in Spanish or English. Dialogue between sisters relies on the fact that the Zapotec word for s sister, fish, serpent, and the verb to come all look alike on the page, but are pronounced <laughs> differently. So they're heteronyms. Toledo has not even tried to translate this game into Spanish. Since Spanish and English do not have the tonal differences and glottal stops that account for this variation in sound, it might be best to try to find a series of homophones and write a creative transposition instead of a translation, which I've been working on. We'll see. Translation, especially from indigenous languages, is always a bartering process. Admittedly, more is lost than can be won. After all, we're talking about different sound systems, worldviews, and even physical environments. But the exchange is still worth the effort, since it not only enriches the receiving culture, but allows the culture of origin to survive. Thank you. Um, why don't we go to David, and then if we have time, I'll show some stuff, because I don't want to okay. yeah, take any more. Thank you, guys. I'm in the company of such great scholars, so I don't feel that I belong here. But I'm going to start out with a short video. You just want to open PowerPoint, David? Sorry. It's not a PowerPoint. I just want oh. to open up the. the okay. Here we go. Background working with uh, languages in Oklahoma, where we still have 35 Native American languages, most of them with a dozen or fewer speakers. And that led to my study. Oh, started <laughs> by the uh, public elementary school in Huchitan's uh, <laughs> orchestra. <laughs> Si catirinja pari dana 
Nekiu Jodi, Kavila, Sikatiguri, Javide, Shiaga, Nikatiga, Nisari, Ruche, Chela. So there you have it, a little sample of what Victor's work sounds like. Basically, I discovered Victor's poetry in 2008 after having spent some time in a small Nahuatl-speaking village outside of Iguala, uh, studying the language. Nahuatl, unlike the moribund languages of Oklahoma, has about 1.5 million speakers across dialects and is the largest indigenous language of North America. I discovered Victor's poetry back in LA. I remember very specifically because it was uh, during college football season 2008 <laughs> and almost like so many I think of of our translations almost immediately translated the poem that I'd found into English which is the first poem those are actually two poems in that video the North Wind Whips which uh, was very quickly accepted by poetry and appeared in April 2009 and uh, after translating it, I, I got in touch with Victor by email, and I began, I, because of my experience in linguistics, I had a lot of experience working with languages that I couldn't speak, uh, both in terms of syntax and uh, phonological grammar, sounds, and how they changed. And so, I, uh, I have quite a collection of, uh, of Zapotec grammars, actually, across all sorts of dialects. I'm sure you guys probably do, too. Um, but I, I really um, began to collaborate with Victor and worked, you know, we had about probably a dozen poems by 2010 when we were invited to tour the UK with two Spanish-language poets, David Huerta and Corral Bracho for the centennial of the Mexican Revolution. And it was on that tour, really, seeing in the UK especially, I think most people who, uh, who saw us, we were on tour for two weeks, most people who came to hear us read were not aware that any languages other than Spanish were spoken in Mexico. So there's uh, an incredible novelty factor and Victor's work was incredibly well received. I had the opportunity at that time, while I had met Victor and spent quite a bit of time in Oaxaca and in Zapotec communities, especially in the Sierra, I had the opportunity to hear him read his poetry every night for two weeks, uh, which, which was great uh, for my Zapotec ear, if you will. And it was actually while we were on that tour in 2010, we gave a reading at the Wordsworth Trust in the Lake District in Grasmere, and uh, at the church where, where Wordsworth is buried. And that's where the idea for this anthology actually came from. Uh, sitting on a bench in front of Wordsworth's house, uh, Victor and I were talking about indigenous language poetry and its place in Mexico, something we've been talking about with David Huerta, who, you know, those of you who are familiar with his, his work, you know, he kind of comes from a, a very uh, highly regarded uh, dynasty of Mexican poets. He's very <laughs> mainstream and kind of central. And in talking with him, I began to realize, or I guess my, my observations were confirmed that the conversation between indigenous language poetry of Mexico and Spanish language poetry of Mexico was very much one direction. <laughs> and David, you know, David, while he, he respected Victor greatly, said, told us explicitly, you know, that he did not consider the indigenous poetry traditions to belong to the same lineage as Spanish language poetry, uh, which was interesting. And, and Victor had, uh, couldn't agree more. We were on uh, BBC Four and, and the uh, presenter asked Victor, you know, what does it mean, the centennial of, of the Mexican Revolution? And uh, Victor said, 
absolutely nothing. You know, uh, I'm still not free, uh, which was pretty badass, really. I, uh, <laughs> you know, to see the uh, the presenter's face, you know, a little uh, shocked, and um, I think at that stage, I I had already, and I think especially, actually from my experience working with language conservation in Oklahoma, I, I realized how political and how intensely personal indigenous communities felt about their languages, and rightfully so, when you consider the, the oppression they've endured. And I, I began questioning my, my own role and even what I was doing in, in translating these poems into English. And I, I still do that. I, you know, I think that's a healthy impulse. But I think in conversation with Victor, especially, who's, who's I, I suppose, my best Zapotec friend, and uh, other indigenous Mexican artists and uh, the poet Juan Gregorio Regino, our Mazatec poet from this book. For example, I, I came to realize, and somewhat ironically, given you know the hundreds of languages that English ultimately um, crushed here in our, our own present day United States, that translating these indigenous poets into English gave them an opportunity to sidestep the limitations put on their work by the Spanish speaking poetry community that for the most part ignored them. And to their great satisfaction, I think, they, most of all of the six poets in this anthology, for example, are voracious readers of world literature, most often in translation into Spanish. And I think most all of them consider themselves to be working simultaneously and to varying degrees for and within their own communities and within conversation with world literature at large. And an audience is something very important to them. I think there's, the other thing is uh, that I wanted to mention about this anthology is that the poets in it really reflect the wide variety of linguistic experience that Mexico's indigenous populations face. There are poets like Victor, who kind of like Irma, you know, writes definitively in Zapotec and later translates and feels very strongly about it. He won't speak Spanish at home to this day, you know. And um, then there are poets like the Nahuatl poet, who's actually Victor's same age. He, uh, he speaks Huasteca Nahuatl. And this is actually one of the few poets in here that wasn't translated uh, using Spanish. Hmm. Um, I co-translated it with Adam Kuhn, a scholar of classical Nahuatl that I actually met on a plane uh, coming back from Mexico City. I saw him reading some colonial Nahuatl documents <laughs> and it turned out that, uh, that he had lived in the same village as me to study Nahuatl. And uh, we struck up a, a relationship and he was at this point working in the Huasteca in Veracruz and uh, had, had come across this poet's work. Juan uh, Hernandez, this Nahuatl poet, actually kind of like uh, Manuel Puig or uh, some other writers, writes simultaneously. You know, he said uh, he doesn't write either version first. He mm. says part of his process is actually almost line by line, word by word, or phrase by phrase. And there are significant variations between the two poems. Kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, very similar to your examples with the the literal cribs and mm -hmm. the, uh, the published translations of Irma's work, mm -hmm. he, he calls it a process of mirroring. He says the languages are like two mirrors mm -hmm. that reflect each other. And that to me, I think, is a, 
a really great metaphor for the space that so many speakers of indigenous languages today occupy. You know, they speak Nahuatl at home, but go to school in Spanish. And their thought life lies somewhere in between. Uh, there are other poets in this book, like uh, Enriqueta Lunes, the Tzotzil poet that Claire translated for this book, who didn't grow up speaking uh, Tzotzil. Her grandparents and parent, even her parents spoke at home, but in an effort to provide her a better economic future, they very intentionally did not teach her and prioritized Spanish. And when she reached young adulthood, I think at about 16, 17, she, uh, she decided, you know, it was her language and uh, she wanted to learn it. And she did, and she's an incredible poet. Uh, I think the, the translations Claire's done really speak to that. Um, a few other things that, uh, that I wanted to mention before I open this up to, to questions. Uh, one is the, the issue of self-translation, which uh, you guys have both mentioned. I think one thing that I've noticed about some, but certainly not all, and I think we're, you know, we're on this table talking about some of the most exceptional uh, poets uh, writing in Mexico today, in my opinion, but many indigenous poets, because they're forced to translate their own work, the, I mean, the truth of the matter is that they're not Spanish language poets. There is Mesopotec language poets. And their Spanish, which they learned in school, you know, their, their own translations into Spanish tend to be less dynamic and contemporary than the original poetry itself. It almost has a Baroque or kind of faux poeticism to it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that I've sought to do in, in editing this anthology, for example, is restore some of the, that contemporary feel of a lot of this poetry. I mean, there's Miquea Sanchez, a soque poet, who's participated in, in the workshops that, uh, that my two colleagues have put together. She, um, she has images of like a plains black box and uh, a Macy's store window in New York and poems about illegal African immigrants in Spain. You know, this is incredibly contemporary poetry. Um, and I guess to end, you know, since we're talking about Spanish as a, an intermediary language, there's a, a very interesting project that Victor has uh, embarked upon because of his frustration with the, uh, the one-way influence of um, Isma Zapotec poetry and as part of his project to continue contributing to the language's vitality and evolution, you know, because I think he's aware that in order for Isma Zapotec to survive, it has to continue to evolve. He is, he's just finished translating an anthology called 40 World Poets. And using Spanish cribs, he's translated everyone from Cavafy to Lee Po to Bukowski and E.E. E. Cummings. And I thought to end, I would show you guys his, uh, a video of him reading one of E.E. E. Cummings' poems in his Zapotec, which I recorded in LA. Uh, I guess a month and a half ago? Jen was there, yeah. Sometime around there. Signal. Should we ask for questions while we're figuring yes. this out? Good idea. Sure. Yeah. Questions in the meantime? What would you all like to talk oh, about? Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, now the turn to questions. Yeah. Oh, no. 
zalare le vida le sta di grave io la te ti duri della navi io la te canoni io la te ti nidi io la te spenaia cacita e cielo ne cacita la di ne mina ti na gigi na duji na gigi mi io la te ne divi che sta ne divi che sta ne divi che sta la ua di cielo io la te la ua di cielo di non di io la te Chaudha Shubhanaya, Kaji Chasti Sisti Yudhya Yudhya Chagete, Nechi Indi, Kabehelu, Ranareza Ladinieru, Nika Lulu Na Chande, Viku Na Adi Shini Gendara Nashi, Nezanda Kachula Che, Gendari Abidiru Sintikiri, Rajiva, Rajiva Ludhya Luna Agisa, Nena Kubi, Nina Kalu. Fantastic. Cool. So cool. We, we did a reading for some uh, students at 826 LA and on the west side in Mar Vista, and there were a few Zapotec kids in the audience, which was pretty neat. Great. But before that, I took Victor to Venice Beach, and he was pretty <laughs> thrilled about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, uh, the subtitles are true to the line breaks, too, which mm -hmm. is why they're a little uh, choppy. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you like to talk about? Or what, are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, we got about 15 minutes, so. Yeah. I want to know how you all got to that point in which you all were able to I don't know the language. We don't. That's don't. the problem. In fact, I, my last Alta two years ago, I did a panel on how to translate from a language you don't know, which was a painful panel, you know, because it's, 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 it doesn't feel right. And I've always questioned people who did it, and now I'm doing it, but I feel committed to it. And what we do, and, and Wendy generously introduced me to Irma, because Irma's a teacher as well as a poet, and she sat with me and went line by line with each poem and explained not just the words, literally, but implications and even oh. stories about Natalia and about the village and you know she was very open and, and we were, I need help to do it um, and, and David knows more about the um, structure and the linguistics so he's a big help as well yes um, so many things you said have just resonated with me but for 10 years I took uh, students and teachers to Yucatan and while I'm not uh, Yucatec Mayan speaker I certainly acquainted with many people who do. And one of the best things I ever did is have a Mayan storyteller. Uh, Domingo Sor Put is his name. And he's published collections of his stories in Yucatec Mayan and Spanish. And when we heard him, he's a wonderful storyteller, gifted storyteller. Without really, without looking at the Spanish, you could tell the storytelling part. Hmm. And so part of what I see in what you're doing, David, and what I think is a wonderful, what gives the sounds that you were talking about, the sounds that you can't always convey in poetry, the onomatopoeia, the, 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 you know, the sounds that we want, is um, through technology today and YouTube. Now, I wish I had peeped him and had it up there somewhere. Um, but the other thing that struck me, I was asked, wanted to ask you if there's a connection between the Zapotec poets, the Nahua poets, the Yucatec Mayan writers, is there, because when you said that Zapotec personalizes everything, and you talked about onomatopoeia personification, I thought immediately of the Popol Vuh. That's what you have. I mean, there, there are these things that seem to be cross currents and very, you know, across the language area. So I wondered if, if there's a meeting of those indigenous poets, writers, storytellers in Mexico. I think most, uh, most or many indigenous language writers in Mexico do know each other. There's actually been some, some pretty important initiatives lately even at the uh, at the field in Guadalajara uh, next month there is a um, 
you know, what they call in Spanish a congress of indigenous writers, where they have a, a four-day workshop, and writers come in from all over the country. It's subsidized by the festival. Uh, there's an, a new prize uh, now in its third year called the uh, Prize for Indigenous Literatures of the Americas. It's a $25,000 prize that switches genre every year. It's judged by panels made up of indigenous writers uh, for the most part. Um, I mean, you guys have, have some experience in actually having been a part of some of those gatherings. I mean, those initiatives that come out of the, um, the book festival in Guadalajara um, are, you know, inspired by like years and years of organizing by indigenous writers. And so there's an organization that right now is, is not, not very well organized, but in the past, you know, has called um, the acronym is ELIAC, and it's the Association for um, Writers Working in Indigenous Languages in Mexico. Um, Irma Pineda was the, the president of it for a few years, the only woman to have been president. And while she was president, she did a lot of work to get more women writers engaged with it because it had mostly been male indigenous writers. But there is a lot of communication. One of um, Irma Pineda's books, um, she, it, it, she didn't co write it, she sort of did a two person anthology with a friend of hers who's a Nahuatl speaker. Um, there's actually a, a conference or a poetry festival, I'm forgetting the official name, maybe somebody in this room knows it, of um, all of Latin America for writers working in indigenous languages or poetry specifically yeah. that's produced in indigenous languages that's been going on. I don't know for how long, but as long as I've been engaged with this work. Um, and that I know, you know, many collaborations that have come from writers um, or poets working in indigenous languages from different countries they met each other at this gathering. You know, it's um, been in various um, South American countries. And then there's also, um, the, right, the, after a lot of organizing, there, what, essentially the Mexican version of the NEA has, it's, it, the short name of it is the Sistema. They give grants that are um, actually by giving the local economy much more generous than NEA grants to writers um, and other artists and to scholars. And so for the, um, I think starting about five years ago, two of the grants that they give a year are reserved for um, writers working in native languages, uh, which is a big deal. Because for years, like those writers were all just shut out of, of that process. And now there's actually like dedicated spaces for them. Of course, two isn't very many out of the 50, I think, I think it's 50 that they give. Um, but there's a lot a lot of communication and one of the things that's interesting about that collaboration of these different communities is of course it all happens in Spanish um, so so Edma talks about how you know sometimes she feels like though you know putting a lot of energy into those things means actually less energy going into her Zapotec work because all that work has to happen in Spanish I think uh, your point about multimedia and technology is an important one too mm -hmm. yeah uh, it's always been a part of, of Phoneme's uh, mission as much as our aesthetic. Online we have <clears throat> videos from three of the six languages in here and audio recordings from a couple more. I think what's even more exciting though is to see the way that young Zapotec speakers, for example, are using technology to um, to create in their own languages. I think of, uh, there's a great group now, and you can look them up on YouTube called Hoochie Rap. That, uh, it's these teenagers, they're like uh, 14, 15 years old, and they rap in Isthmus Zapotec. Uh, there's another pirated edition of uh, Spider-Man that was just published as a comic book translated into Isthmus Zapotec. There's a lot of these initiatives happening among young people who are getting excited about their language. Mm -hmm. She had a question first, I think. Yeah. Um, I also tie into multimedia as well as a way of uh, facilitating um, communication um, across geographies uh, between poets. Um, I'm from Tucson and work here um, at the Poetry Center. And so I know that um, a awesome 
Uh, Juan Gregorio Regino, the Mazatec poet, is uh, putting together a World Indigenous Poetry Congress. And I just talked to him. He was just in L.A. Uh, last week. And it was originally scheduled for February of next year, but he thinks more realistically it will happen in the fall. Um, I think the biggest obstacle to, to more of that happening really is is the uh, financial mm -hmm. considerations involved. Where would, was he thinking of where? Uh, in Mexico. Oh, okay. You, you had another question. Or, I'm oh, sorry, I, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, when you were mentioning the, uh, the 14-year-old rappers in an earlier session, we saw a video of Renata Flores, who was a 14-year-old Peruvian uh, girl who had her grandmother translate Michael Jackson's The Way You Make Me Feel into Quechua. I've and seen that. She, yeah, that's great. And uh, she has a video uh, of her standing in front of some stuff, you know, I'm not sure what it is in Cusco, um, you know, singing Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> she has an Alicia Keys song, too, that she does, and her grandma translates them for her to catch one. It's pretty cool. Did you had something to say about that, about the other question? Did you? About oh, the okay. um, I know of some individual efforts that have happened. There's a, um, a Lumi writer um, who used to live in Seattle, um, which is where I live, who spent two years in San Cristobal and got to know a number of indigenous writers at that time. Um, uh, her name's Shinawai Gawa. And, and I think, you know, what David says is true, that she essentially stopped doing that work because um, there's no support for it. Um, and, you know, it's it has to be a labor of love. <laughs> and, you know, I know, at least in the case of Shinawa, like, she, you know, her energies are pulled in many, many different directions, and I hear her talking about some of the same things I hear Irma talking about. Is like, okay, am I going to contribute to this larger community? Am I going to contribute to my community? There's just a lot of different demands on, on people's time, I think. And then I also wanted to pass this around, um, going back to the earlier question about multimedia. This is one of a wonderful series um, by uh, Mexico City publisher, Rolalia, uh, that they have, this is a book by Irma Pineda that has a CD at the back. So it's bilingual Spanish, Zapotec, and then there's all the audio in the back. And I, um, so if, uh, actually, Enrique Tolunes, who's in Like a New Sun, also has one of them. Miguel Sanchez um, has one. And they are planning to do more. And they're hoping to actually maybe move toward being able to have trilingual editions, including English, that would be marketed outside of Mexico. Uh, but the CD, you know, is crucial. And um, for the first collection I have of Irma's poetry, I had her come up to, which hasn't been published, I had her come up to Seattle and we recorded in a studio all the poems in all three languages. Because I do think that there is so much that you lose, especially with a tonal language. Um, so at least the audio is a way to not lose all of it. And those, uh, those uh, Pluralia editions, are, uh, you can buy them through their website online. Yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah. They all they're, match They're colors. incredibly well really done. <laughs> so, yeah. so you had a question. Yeah. yeah. And then. Yeah, I was actually um, started to answer it um, after raising my hand. There's two things. One is the, uh, the, the CD that you mentioned. The topic of minor, minor translation is an important one to emphasize. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the translation should emphasize the difference so that the, the original language is not some kind of 
it's assumed into the translation. Mm -hmm. right? So that, that edge right there is the really interesting part for me, where the translation, the Spanish translation needs to, they only need to sound antiquated, right? mm -hmm. what David was talking about. It needs to sound, or needs to sound flatter, or needs to sound, um, needs to not have all the richness of the sound in the language in order to preserve the spatial language that needs the translation, that they can't do without the translation. Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. You mean by struggle, you mean the same power struggle? Do you mean in terms of power? What do you mean by the, it's not the same struggle? One uh, anecdote that uh, kind of speaks to that. I think that's that's mostly true. Uh, when Victor and I did that tour of the UK, the Poetry Translation Center in London printed a beautiful chapbook that uh, that we sold at the tour. And when Victor got back to Uchitan, he was so proud, and all of his friends were so proud that he'd been translated into English that he actually made a pirated copy of his own chapbook <laughs> in an edition of a thousand, I think. Wow. And uh, people all wanted them. They couldn't read them, but the, the sense, they don't feel as though they're being linguistically oppressed by English. Mm -hmm. In fact, they felt like it was celebrating their language. Uh, whereas, you know, nobody, unfortunately is uh, rushing out to get Victor's books in Spanish, you know. Uh, so there definitely is a different, a different relationship. Uh, although, you know, English is, uh, like I said, the kind of irony because it's, it's uh, responsible for so much mm -hmm. yeah. linguistic attrition around the world. Lily had a question that we probably... Yeah. One more question, and then you're welcome to stay in chat, but we don't want to keep you at so, this 520. Uh, I don't know if it was somewhat related to that comment. I want to phrase it a different way. Uh, it's interesting to see that, yeah, the power relations between languages are not fixed. Yeah, it depends on the context. And, you know, whereas here, Spanish sometimes is viewed as the not dominant language, and there's a struggle to yeah. mm -hmm. have it be acknowledged vis-a-vis um, -vis English in Mexico, the indigenous languages are struggling against Spanish, and I thought it was really interesting that they are bypassing the Spanish mm -hmm. gatekeepers and going directly to English to a fresher translation uh, than what the poets themselves are able to do going into their non-native language. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's important to note, too, that uh, that same struggle is happening here, mm -hmm. you know. And L.A. has the largest population of Zapotec speakers mm -hmm. outside of Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're still very much engaged in, in that struggle. How, how, many, how many of you are poets? I'm not a poet. I am. David is. So, but I, I, I ask because I think that with poets, I can think that rhythmically English has something that's different Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's something poetic about English that might be even more than that. that the tra that even hearing the translation in English read with the translator of type, you know, like the way he was on tour, for example, like that made probably a difference to him. Yeah. That he heard it in a, in, a, in a language where the rhythm made more sense. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I know some Spanish speaking poets who have been translated into German and like they, 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 they talk about the awkwardness of being hearing themselves in, in the language that's totally different from like rhythmically different mm. from what they read. Well, so, it Irma Pineda and, and other um, Zapotec writers that I've um, talked to um, and, and in a tiny way translated, um, and I'd be interested to hear what you two have hear, heard, it, they all talk about how their poems sound more familiar to them in English than they do in Spanish, and that sonically um, English and Zapotec are closer in a lot of ways than Spanish and Zapotec are. Um, and so, I, I mean, I'm speaking at, at, with total ignorance on terms of the linguistics of it, but it's interesting to me sometimes things that Irma abandoned in moving to Spanish, like I can get back pretty easily. Um, so yeah, I think that there are, you know, obviously there are a million different ways that languages are similar and dissimilar to each other, but it's also interesting to me as there's now a growing population in Los Angeles and elsewhere of um, folks that speak Zapotec in English but not really Spanish. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what starts to happen as we have a, a community that's bilingual that way, you know, without the Spanish. There's actually, I just heard um, last week in LA there was a concert of uh, rock and rap in indigenous Mexican languages, and there's actually a booming mixed deck rap scene mm -hmm. in Fresno, California. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, weird. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.